Hello, everybody. I'm Dave. Uh, if you want to tweet stuff, Neary D on Twitter. Uh, D Neary is Diane Neary. She's a librarian in New York. She's awesome. I don't know her except on Twitter uh, because lots of people tweeted stuff to her instead of me. But um, so, uh, how to overcome culture clash? So, I'm not an expert in this. Um, this is just me sharing some of the things that I have read, learned about, that I found interesting, that kind of plugged into the way that I've been talking to partners, developer communities in other countries about how they can be more effective in open source. But I think there are also lessons for uh, open source developers about how they can be more welcoming to people from other cultures. So it was Culture Clash, uh, culture, cult, the Culture Club and the Clash. Was that too uh, subtle? Uh, anyway, um, so communities are messy. This is a maker community. There's stuff everywhere. But they're not just messy physically. They're messy because there's human relationships, and human relationships are messy. Humans are messy. Um, you know, humans on their own are not, but once they start to get into pairs, that things break down quickly. Um, and cultural differences are very confusing. So this hand sign here on the on the right, this, uh, depending on whether you're from Japan, from America, whether you're a diver, whether you're from France uh, or Poland, will mean completely different things. Right? To some cultures, it means zero, nothing. Uh, to other cultures, it means A-OK. -okay. Uh, in Japan, that means money. And in some Middle Eastern countries, I believe this is uh, the equivalent to the middle finger. Oh, dear. So, same signal. Um, and, and, you know, how do you greet people? I, have a, a, I remember a specific conference. I met a, a friend that I've known for many years. And um, so I've, I'm Irish. Uh, in Ireland, we don't touch each other very much. Um, it's true. It's so true. It's true. We don't, like, <laughs> physical contact is not a thing. I lived in France for many years, and in France we, we kiss quite a lot. Uh, but there's no kind of, uh, there's, there's a certain space that's respected. It's kind of you lean in. Um, and in the U.S., people are huggers, I've found. That lots, of, lots of Americans hug. And I met this American friend that I had met in many different contexts, and I was like, I don't know what the appropriate physical contact is. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, that's, you know, that's nice. I appreciate that. We can have a hug. And it was like, it was OK. But physical contact, how do you greet people? Uh, how do you behave in different cultures is kind of confusing. Um, and it's not something we're comfortable talking about very much, which is strange. Uh, because uh, so this is the iceberg picture. Um, there's the things we do, and then there are the reasons why we do them. And, uh, there's how you interpret and react to what other people do, and your interpretations and reactions are deep-seated in your upbringing, your values, your culture, the things that you've learned, the family that you were born in. This gentleman down here could probably give this talk because you were actually talking about exactly this. We all live in our own little bubble. Uh, we have a common heritage with other people who have similar bubbles because they grew up in the same area, with the same religion, went to the same schools, had the same friends. Um, and yet, once we travel, we, we bump into other bubbles. And uh, you know, is the person who I am perceiving is rude being rude, or just behaving as they would normally behave and not understanding why I'm getting upset? Uh, so it's all kind of strange. Um, there are many aspects that go into culture. Um, there are seven of them that are, that are commonly cited, social organization, religious attitudes, uh, language. Uh, heritage in arts and culture, uh, economic systems, forms of government, etc. Um, but a, a colleague of mine, Flavio Prococo, um, found this definition somewhere, which I thought was kind of nice. It's, it's the way, it's the, culture is the way humans in a community actually get stuff done, actually do stuff. It's, it's the explanation for how we behave and how we react. So how do we get past cultural differences? Because there are, there are many. We agree they're messy. We agree it's a problem in open source communities, I assume. Um, and there, you know, some of them are, are, are a little bit practically difficult to address, things like geographical and language differences. Uh, but there's the actual cultural uh, reactions, how we deal with each other. So I'm going to, uh, by the way, there are a few bit.ly links in here. And any of the, uh, if they're books, any of the links, if you want to follow them, will uh, go to a smile.amazon.com, which will support the Software Freedom Conservancy with a few dollars if you choose to buy them. Don't feel obliged. I'm just letting you know that. Uh, so how do we get past cultural differences? So, um, well, so everybody here has probably heard the expression tragedy of the commons. 
how many people are aware of the original source and have read the, the original paper from Garrett Hardin? Okay, uh, there's three or four, but that's, that's good. So the idea of the tragedy of the commons is uh, if there is a common good, and Hardin wrote about this in, in fact in the context of any um, restricted uh, entity, but, it, but one, of the, one of the examples he chose which, which kind of got picked up prominently was population control, uh, which was a big issue in the 60s, late 60s when he wrote this. Uh, so when you have a common good and you have many people who are sharing it, and those who are from Ireland, and I see a few people who are at least living in Ireland, commonage is still very common in, in, in uh, uh, agricultural communities in Ireland where you have like hills, right, where it's a big area of space and you might put a very sparse number of animals on there. So m many, com many families will share a part of the commonage and they will farm turf there or put animals on the land. And it's a shared good, uh, shared by a number of people. And Hardin's theory is that any time uh, you have a, a, a fixed good which is shared by people, uh, it is in everybody's self-interest to behave in a way which is detrimental to the common good. In other words, detrimental to the group interest. Uh, because if you have, for example, a piece of land that can support 100 cattle, um, and there are 10 families, that's 10 cattle each, right? But if I put an 11th cattle, I am getting 10% more productivity for a cost to the common good of 1%, one extra cow on top of 100. So I'm degrading the common good a little bit, and that degradation is spread across 10 families, so I'm actually, it's in my self-interest to, to take more than my fair share. Um, and so this is the problem that, that Hardin presents. And, and there are a, a number of obvious solutions. Hardin is famously uh, libertarian. Uh, and so his solution was, well, what you should do is not have the common good. You should have everything be private property. And therefore, everyone has control, total control over their own 10% of the common good. And therefore, they will, they will curate and maintain it in a way which, is, which makes it long-term sustainable. There are other solutions. Uh, in fact, this is one of the interesting papers that's uh, appealed to both libertarians and uh, communists, for example, or uh, social democrats uh, in terms of a way that one should manage a common good. Um, one way is to elect a government or to elect a council of seniors who will uh, ensure that everybody respects the rules. So you create an outside body with the respect of all which enforces a, a common set of rules. One can use uh, a religion or autocratic power to protect the common good. Um, so you have a religion which, uh, which reinforces the values and the lore and, and so maybe people behave in a certain way and they don't understand why they're behaving in that way but they know that this is the way things are done. Um, so what happens when these various solutions to this problem meet? Um, what happens, so this is a, a, a book uh, called Moral Tribes, which I'll reference later, uh, describes what's, what he calls the tragedy of common sense morality, uh, where four people who have had this common space have, have, have solved this problem in four different ways. One is with, a, with an autocratic uh, government. One is with uh, the rule of religion. Another is a council of elders that, that curates the body. And then you've got the libertarian uh, private property overall uh, solution. They meet when a fire destroys the land which had been a, a kind of a dense forest which had separated them for many years. What happens? Well, um, the people who value private property overall say, well, this is unclaimed property. We're now going to go in and claim this land. Uh, the people who are communists say, well, hold on a second. This is the people's land. We should share this as a common good. And so they get into, into trouble. The religious uh, governed society takes offense when somebody from, uh, from the, uh, the southern land uh, is singing on Tuesday, something which is forbidden by the religion, and, and so on and so on. And you have this series of conflicts because these cultures are colliding and their values don't match. So he calls this a tragedy of common sense morality. Uh, this is a book I, I, I it's, it's, a lot of these sources are, are from behavioral psychology, um, uh, which is a fascinating field. It's about why people behave the way they do, which is uh, something that I've become increasingly interested in. Um, and Green talks a lot about uh, the trolley problem. I don't know if, uh, if you're aware of this. It's if you're at a switch and you can see a train heading for one person on the track, so you can, and you can turn it, or heading for five people on the tracks, and you can turn it 
to hit one person, should you, should you hit the switch? And the, you know, the logical answer is yes, you should do the thing which is the greater good. Um, but in fact, whether you do it or not depends on how far and how empath empathetic you are to the one person that you will kill. Um, it's very interesting. Anyway, he talks about the, the laws of common sense morality and the natures of why we do things. And uh, so we come to culture. Um, so that uh, this another sociologist called Hurt Hofstede, I believe he's Dutch, could be Belgian, uh, I believe he's Dutch, um, described six dimensions of culture, six kind of uh, core characteristics which can be used to define a six-dimensional vector which will describe how individuals, organizations uh, approach culture. Can I get a time check off you? I, I haven't been keeping time. Uh, oh. I'm doing really well. I'm going, am I going too fast? No. Good. Uh, which is that this was really the thing that uh, I think kind of got me uh, thinking about this more deeply. Um, obviously not as deeply as Mr. Hofstede, but um, uh, he describes these characteristics which can apply and then you can, uh, you can extract yeah. characteristics of a society from uh, its approach to religion, uh, social structure, education, parenting, um, general values of a society along the seven axes that we saw earlier uh, with these six dimensions of culture that he identifies. So these are the six. Uh, the first is the power distance index which was uh, made uh, popularized by Malcolm Gladwell in the book Outliers, uh, if any of you have read that. Um, I don't have a link for that, so, so if you're going to, you know, anyway. Uh, wh which is uh, about how people uh, react to hierarchy. Uh, it, and I'll go into each of these in, in individually afterwards. Uh, masculine versus feminine, which is not the same as male dominated versus female dominated. Uh, it's about the, val the, the, the traits, the character traits that are valued in a culture. Individualism versus collectivism, uh, uncertainty avoidance, past versus future, um, or current focus, and then indulgence versus uh, self-constraint. And so, if we look at power distance, uh, low power distance means uh, a flat hierarchy, a flat social hierarchy, uh, lack of respect for elders, there's no kind of inherent respect for elders, um, questioning of authority, uh, student-centered education. This is something that was very surprising to me when I moved to the US was that the teachers are very focused on each individual student um, growing as an individual rather than the class as a whole respecting a certain uh, behavioral norms, doing homework, forcing kids to do homework, that kind of thing. Um, which is, I thought was quite interesting. It's, it's, there's very student-centered education in the US. Uh, Teacher-centered edu centered education would be what, would I, what I would have come from, from France, where, where you expect the kids to conform to what the teacher tells them to do, um, even to the detriment of the individual being able to express themselves. Um, in the, the, the subordinate relationship in work is one that's really interesting. In, uh, in, high, in low power distance cultures, subordinates expect to be consulted on decisions that affect them. Whereas in higher power, uh, power distance uh, cultures, subordinates expect to get very clear instruction so that they can execute on a clear plan. Um, you can imagine how this, uh, this creates culture conflict when people from a higher, high power uh, distance culture start to work in, in companies or, or, or cultures that have a low power distance. Uh, on one end, it's like, I don't understand. I keep asking what, what he would like us to do, and he's not giving, he's, it's like, okay, okay, okay. And then on the other end, it's, I don't understand. This manager won't tell me what they want me to do. I, I'm trying to do things in, 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 kind of in, in this framework, and I'm not getting clear direction. So that's the kind of thing that, uh, that you see. Uh, some examples of low power distance Israel. Um, actually, quite famously, um, there's a, an, a, 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 what's an anecdote by uh, another social behaviorist called Danny Kahneman, uh, uh, K A H N E M A N, who also wrote a lot of stuff about how why, be, why people behave irrationally. Um, 
where he says it's the first time that he was teaching in Israel, uh, students uh, would shout out when, he was, when they disagreed with him and, and would get into uh, back and forth discussions with the professor saying he's wrong, you're wrong, and, and, and uh, uh, this is something that was uh, completely foreign to him from before. Uh, so very, uh, very flat social structure in, in Israel compared to something like in Malaysia or China where there is a very strong respect for hierarchy. Individual versus collectivism, I think probably a lot of this can be traced back historically. Uh, this is one of the bigger ones uh, that would be a difference between uh, some uh, European cultures and Asian cultures and, and, and North America. Uh, I think America being founded on uh, lowering taxation, creating independence from a, from a, from a foreign power, um, has a very, very strong emphasis on the individual, individual autonomy, um, freedom, uh, the ability to, uh, to uh, be left alone from govern government interference on the one end, and on the collectivist side, the idea that we have a responsibility to I, that, uh, that as a collective we, uh, we are responsible for each other's well-being and provide a, a safety net to the, to the weakest in the culture. Um, and you can again see how these, co these societies um, or these societal tendencies will, uh, will conflict. Some of these are aligned, by the way. Uh, uncertainty avoidance. Um, on the one end, we have uh, cultures with uh, low uncertainty avoidance, ready to take risk, more venture capital, uh, faster growth, acceptance of failure. On the high uh, uncertainty avoidance, we have uh, a reluctance to take on debt. We have uh, change is seen as a threat to ways of life. Um, there are a lot of rules and regulations which even if people don't respect them, and that's often the case in countries like, like Germany or France, for example, uh, we, we're, we're happy that there are, the rules and regulations are there. Um, there's a need for rules and structure and then there's a rejection of all structure on the other side. Um, masculinity versus femininity. One of the biggest things here is how do you make decisions? How do we arrive at consensus? Is it by ideas conflicting each other uh, and confronting each other in argument? Or is it by working together and collaborating against a common enemy and a common problem that's identified? Um, this is... Uh, uh, so there, there are actually very few countries that are uh, very, uh, very high on the feminine side, low masculinity index. Um, most of them are northern European socialist states. Uh, take from that which, what you will. Uh, but there are also kind of southern European uh, states are, have a very high masculine index where there's, there's like in France, for example, uh, there is still a very male-dominated culture and uh, there's a rewards-based culture. It's a focus on the task over the individual. It's a focus on facts over feelings. Um, and these are the differences between masculine and feminine societies. Uh, focus on the long term versus the short term. Um, long term focus, persistence, savings, investment in the future are things that are valued. Uh, short term focus, the next quarter. Uh, traditions, focus on reproducing what's happened in the past. Uh, nationalism and love of country are, uh, is something that's very common in short term focus countries. Um, it's interesting to see UK, Germany, and the USA are the, the three countries that score the lowest on the short-term focus, given um, recent political developments, at least in the USA and the UK. I'm not going to get into that. I, 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 I promised I wasn't going to talk politics, but, uh, but it's kind of tough to avoid it. Um, a colleague told me an, an anecdote where he was on a, on a trade delegation uh, to China. And... Uh, learned from uh, one of the people that they were meeting that uh, the Chinese were investing in kindergarten and primary schools in, in African countries. And it's like, why, why would you invest in primary schools in African countries? Surely it makes more sense to invest in research projects and, and uh, universities. And it's like, well, first we need to get more people literate through primary school then in five years we're going to invest more in secondary schools and in 10 years we'll start to invest in universities so that in 15 and 20 years when we need the graduates we'll, we will have a, a, a collection of graduates. This is long term thinking. Um, in the USA it's uh, I want to invest in postdocs because I want something that's going to give me an immediate return for my investment. Uh, so there's that. 
And then this is the one that's, uh, it, so long term, short term, and indulgent versus restrained were added after the original, the four first, which were the original four that uh, Hofstede identified. So this is the one that has the least data. Uh, indulgent societies, uh, people are focused on uh, the immediacy, happiness, uh, restrained, uh, people focus not so much on their feelings or expressing their feelings. Uh, freedom of speech is less of a res responsibility. You see lower birth rates uh, and higher security forces, stricter sexual norms. You can read as well as I can. <laughs> okay, so there are other aspects. Uh, I mentioned touch a few times, haptic communication, body language, another anecdote. Um, there are uh, people who you can walk backwards across a room by stepping in a quarter of a step every couple of minutes, they will step back without even realizing they're doing it, and you can just keep walking them back. This is a, um, particularly Americans have, have, have a, an idea of personal space, which is a little bit larger than others. Uh, there are regions of the United States where um, people are more uncomfortable with silence. So we talked about the moderator who speaks too much earlier. Um, in some groups, it is considered polite to leave a pause of a half a second when somebody is finished so that you're sure that the other person is finished. Um, if you get somebody from Houston, Texas, and there's a half a second pause, they will feel uncomfortable, physically uncomfortable, and will feel obliged to stop you from being uncomfortable too, to fill that space with speech. So that's how you end up with one person keeping completely one side of the conversation uh, while the other person is continually waiting for an opportunity to get a word in. Um, just one example of, of, of the ways in which communication style uh, can change from one area to another. Did you have a question? No, 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 I'm from Houston, Texas. Oh. <laughs> can you vote for this? Is this uh, true? I won't confirm or deny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is all very interesting stuff. We have our six dimensions of culture and we have uh, some more components around uh, the nature of touch and body language and personal space and uh, perfect, thank you. But how is this useful? Uh, what can we learn from this in open source? Um, so, one more book reference, and this, I'm assuming more people are aware. Uh, who, who here has read this book, Getting to Yes? Uh, this is a must read book. You, do, do, you must get this book. Uh, so, this is um, a, about negotiation, but not negotiation in the confrontational sense of the word. This is a book, it was the first book written from the Harvard Negotiation Project, which is Fabulous. Which is fabulous. Which is fabulous. And there are a bunch of so there's there's difficult conversations is another one. Um, it's a collection of sociologists, politicians, uh, diplomats, um, uh, business people who have gotten together to try and understand the nature of uh, getting to um, win-win negotiated deals. And uh, one of the things that uh, that comes out of um, the, the Harvard uh, project, I don't believe it's in this book, but this is definitely one that you should read, uh, is uh, types of communication. So when you speak to somebody else, there are four things that you can do to communicate with, with them. One is you can ask a question, inquiry. Um, another is to repeat something that they said in your words to ensure that you have understood them correctly, paraphrasal. Uh, Another is to acknowledge that you understand where they are coming from, acknowledgement. And then finally, you can make uh, a statement of your own, affirmation. You're, 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 you're uh, just coming straight back with your opinion. Um, first up there is active listening. So the idea of active listening is that you, uh, you're empathically listening to the person that you have opposite you uh, to, uh, to really try and understand what they're getting at. I've, I've listed that as part of communication, even though that is not one of the four ways that you would communicate with somebody else, but I think it's a, a vital uh, component. Most discussions in open source communities are 90% uh, or more affirmation. We say what we believe, the other person says what they believe, and there is actually very little meeting in the middle. Um, there are a few reasons why that's problematic. Uh, one. Uh, is one that uh, this gentleman mentioned as well, uh, actor-observer bias or actor-observer observer asymmetry. This is a cognitive bias whereby everybody assumes that the other knows everything that they know and is also aware of everything that they don't know. So um, why would somebody suggest this when they know that this other thing is true 
and that makes their proposal completely unreasonable. This person is unreasonable. Um, if you don't assume that the other person knows everything that you know, and you say, well, have you considered this? You can actually end up with better solutions. Combine that with uh, another cognitive bias, bias which is uh, the group communication bias, perhaps, or uh, I can't remember the name of it, which is that uh, when you get a group of people together, they are more likely to talk about stuff that they already share in terms of knowledge than sharing information that they have which is unique to the group. You say the things that everybody already agrees on rather than rocking the boat by bringing new information to the table. Combine that with actor-observer bias and you get very suboptimal um, solutions. So you, it's important that you question assumptions when you're coming to the table and using all of those ways of communicating, asking good questions, listening actively to the answers, ensuring that you paraphrase those and say, well, hold on, I just want to make sure that we're sharing the same assumptions here, um, is, and, and understanding, creating a common frame of reference is vital to good communication across cultures. I'm sorry, there are no easy fixes here. I mean, I, mean, I wish there were. Uh, but this is uh, vital. Two or three concrete <coughs> tips. One is a focus on the relationship. The Chinese have a terrific word, which I, I'm going to pronounce wrong. I, I tried to learn the pronunciation for, it, for a Chinese audience, and I said it several times. And uh, they said, I don't understand. And, um, and then I wrote it, and they said, I don't understand. And I looked up on the inter internet the diagram, and they said, ah, guanxi. And that's what I've been saying all along as far as I was concerned. <laughs> How often does this happen? So they have this wonderful word called guanxi, which, which translates directly to relationship, but it means so much more than that. Um, it's one of the reasons why when Chinese companies are working with American companies, the American companies are wondering, why are these people dancing around the topics all the time, and why do they want to go to dinner all the time? And the Chinese companies are frustrated because these Americans want to talk business without having a relationship on which they can construct a, a relationship of trust. Uh, so focus on the relationship. Um, everything you should do to integrate um, people from, from minority cultures should be focused on how can we get a, a closer relationship with individuals in that community. And uh, another Chinese uh, saying from uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, I think, um, I may be pronouncing it, no, I'm, Deng Xiaoping. Uh, Doesn't matter. <laughs> Cross the river by feeling the stones. Um, he talked about this is how the Chinese economy would develop. Essentially, we're going to do one thing, we're going to see how it works out, and then we're going to do another thing. When we're sure we have a sure foothold, then we're going to go on to the next step. Cross the river by feeling the stones. Um, so, small steps. So how can we do that? In terms of projects. Uh, so I didn't see Brian's talk earlier. I tried to get in. Sorry. Um, but you grow relationships so it's one conversation at a time. Uh, I would say encouraging local user groups is a great move as long as they do not become isolated from the whole. Uh, so that's why it's important if you're going to invest in uh, geographical diversity in your community, encouraging those local groups allows a local, su uh, a lo a local support group. It allows people who can talk to each other in their local language and share knowledge and share experience and come at, come at your community with a beginner's eye. Um, but it's also important that you build that bridge. So there are two ways to do that. One is to bring people from those local communities to your global events and treat them as VIPs. Really introduce them, bring them out to dinner, introduce them to the, to the leaders of your community and start to create that, those relationships. And also send your community leaders to those local user groups to speak directly to the local communities and again, build relationships within, that, within those groups. Um, mentorship is vital both inside the local groups. Uh, ensure that there are mentors. If you have people in, for example, China, who are already engaged in your community, ask them if they will help others to become more involved because they will help navigate the roadblocks of your community in a culturally, f coming from the frame of reference of the people that they're talking to. Uh, so that's for projects. For individuals, uh, cross the river by uh, feeling the stones. Start small, propose small changes, and listen to feedback. Try and learn, the, learn you know, when in Rome, uh, try and learn what the norms and cultural uh, uh, sensitivities of a community are. Um, I think it's important to learn how to argue in a community, to learn how to, uh, when you get feedback on a patch, for example, to learn uh, the best way to manifest that you don't agree with this feedback or don't understand this feedback. Um, 
and again, identifying potential mentors in your local community who can help you is a very important step. And then finally, um, so I can leave a couple of minutes for questions, I guess. Uh, geographic, ge geography and language, unfortunately, we're not going to do anything anytime soon which is going to make India fewer than nine time zones from California. Um, so avoid real-time meetings. For God's sake, don't have your Chinese and your Indian um, contributors attending meetings at 11 p.m. or 1 a.m. It's just anti-social. It's anti-family. It's anti-everything. Um, and I know, e I mean, even in work, this is, this is a common occurrence where, where I have contributors who I'd, I'd like, stop inviting me to meetings while you're at dinner. It's just inconvenient. We can do it an hour earlier or an hour later, and it's still okay for me. And, you know, but let's not have a meeting at all if we can avoid it. So avoid real-time meetings. It's vital. Uh, be aware of major holidays. Every, if, I had, if I had a dollar for every time that I heard somebody in an open source community say, look, we had to choose a date and we can't make everybody happy, uh, I would have quite a few dollars. But if you are moderately culturally aware and you are aware of the major, like the one cannot miss it, this is the vital major holiday, like Christmas for, for Christians, um, in the year, uh, you would avoid uh, maybe one week in September because of Rosh Hashanah. You would avoid one week uh, around now because of Chinese New Year. You would avoid one week in, uh, in perhaps November for Diwali. And, and that would be it. Like it's, it's only four or five weeks in the year and you've covered uh, Hindu, um, most, Indian, most uh, sorry, Asian religions, uh, most Christian religions, and, uh, and uh, Judaism. Right? It's not that hard uh, to, to identify the four major holidays uh, across four major world religions. Um, language is always going to be an issue, and it's one that's unfortunately impossible to fix. Uh, well, it's very difficult to fix. But you can make it easier by avoiding uh, real-time meetings. IRC even is hard, because typing in a, in a foreign language is, is hard, and you get left behind in the conversation. Um, and also, I think, encouraging those local communities by keeping them connected to the whole helps with both the geography and the language issues. Sorry, I rushed through that a little, a little bit at the end. Do I have time for a question? Yeah, a couple or two? A couple of questions, couple, couple of questions? Anybody have questions? Contributions? I'm not an expert in this. I just want to say thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> How do you do? This is one of the best talks I've, I've been to this week. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so I have a question that's going to go a bit more. Um, you were saying in the last few slides that uh, you discourage uh, real-time communication. And well, my experience was from work at uh, open source community, but it's clearly the same problem to the US. Yep. Uh, I have a team that is split between France and the USA. And so, I mean, uh, as you are, I'm not an expert, and I haven't read as much as you as you have. And I really appreciate this, uh, this, uh, this presentation. It really brings uh, a number of bits of insight I didn't have until now. Mm -hmm. And what I was told until now is face-to-face -face communication, usually one-to-one, -to -one, uh, is a very good way to attempt uh, to defuse the situation. And I agree. Yeah. And and so people tend to, uh, to advise to do face-to-face uh, -face talk, uh, even if it has to be a true uh, video conferencing tools. And I was told to avoid as much as possible written communication, which is kind of... Okay, it's, it's exactly the opposite. So, um, so let me provide context. Uh, I think the weekly status meeting is a waste of time. Uh, if there's an issue, it needs to be addressed. So the question becomes, how do you identify issues before, before they become serious enough? And I agree, real, real, like face-to-face, -face, getting teams together is probably the most valuable way that open source projects can spend their money. Um, but be aware that if you're bringing 10 Chinese contributors to a global conference, which is 1,000 people, what you're going to find is that those 10 people stay together all week, and they're not going to build any relationships inside that community, which is my personal experience. So. That's, that's why I suggest bringing smaller numbers if you're bringing them to a big conference, because it can be overwhelming. And also make sure that there's a support, support net there when they arrive. Yeah. Um, 
for, for work, I think it's, yeah, it's very valuable to meet each other and it's very valuable for people to talk one-on-one -on -one when there's a need. I don't think there should be a, a, like, don't have weekly status meetings if you don't need one, right? Have meetings with an agenda. That's actually just free tip <laughs> on top. Thank you. Last question, I think. That says, well, just ask people what's the what's the arrangement that would like because uh, sometimes people would be able to tell you uh, you don't necessarily have to move a meeting, you may have to do something differently. Sure. For example, I've worked uh, quite a lot in the Middle East and you can very easily uh, work around Ramadan if you actually ask them how they're more comfortable working. Right. So well, Ramadan would actually, funny enough, be one of the things that I would not particularly avoid for a, but Aid would be like uh, the, the the end of Ramadan. Yeah. Okay. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, although uh, on asking, be careful because uh, some of those cultural dimensions, one of the one of the things in communication style will be um, doesn't want to put other people out. Right, so there's there, there there are cultures where you're much more comfortable expressing when you disagree, even when some even when somebody is explicitly asking, where you're much more comfortable expressing discomfort or disagreement than other cultures. So it's something to be aware of. Yeah, but part of it is also what we were saying earlier about building relationships with people and uh, and understanding how how they work. Which, yeah. which is also where I'm having a channel where you can have informal talk to just get to know. I agree. I think I'm out of time, so I'm happy to continue this outside. But thank you very much.